Uh, good morning, your eminences and excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the theme of this conference uh, suggests uh, that you are concerned about what uh, might happen to faith in the new millennium, as well you should be. Uh, in addition to our computers, which are close to having a nervous breakdown in anticipation of the year 2000, uh, there is a great deal of uh, frantic talk about the 21st century and how it will pose for us unique problems of which we know very little, but for which uh, nonetheless we're supposed to carefully prepare. Uh, everyone seems to worry about this, uh, business people, politicians, educators, as well as theologians. Now, at the risk of sounding uh, patronizing, May I try to put everyone's mind at ease? I doubt that the 21st century will pose for us problems that are more stunning, disorienting, or complex than those we faced in this century, or the 19th, 18th, 17th, or for that matter, many of the centuries before that. But for those of you who are, who are excessively nervous, about the new millennium, I can provide right at the start some good advice about how to confront it. The advice comes from people whom we can trust and whose thoughtfulness, it's safe to say, exceeds that of President Clinton, Newt Gingrich, or even Bill Gates. Here's what Henry David Thoreau said. All our inventions are but improved means to an unimproved end. Here's what Goethe told us. One should each day try to hear a little song, read a good poem, see a fine picture, and if possible, speak a few reasonable words. Socrates told us the unexamined life is not worth living. Rabbi Hillel said, what is hateful to thee, do not do to another. And here's the prophet Micah. What does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? And I could, I could say if we had the time, although you know it well enough, what Jesus, Isaiah, Mohammed, Spinoza, and Shakespeare told us, it's all the same. There is no escaping from ourselves. The human dilemma is as it has always been, and it is a delusion to believe that the technological changes of our era have rendered irrelevant the wisdom of the ages and the sages. Nonetheless, having said this, I know perfectly well that because we do live in a technological age, we have some special problems that Jesus, Hillel, Socrates, and Micah did not and could not speak of. Now, I don't have the wisdom to say what we ought to do about such problems. And so my contribution must confine itself to some things we need to know in order to address the problems. I call my talk, Five Things We Need to Know About Technological Change. I base these ideas on my 30 years of studying the history of technological change, but I do not think these are academic or esoteric ideas. They are the sorts of things everyone who is concerned with cultural stability and balance should know, and I offer them to you in the hope that you'll find them useful in thinking about the effects of technology on religious faith. The first idea is that all technological change is a trade-off. I like to call it a Faustian bargain. Technology giveth, and technology taketh away. This means that for every advantage 
a new technology offers, there is always a corresponding disadvantage. The disadvantage may exceed in importance the advantage, or the advantage may well be worth the cost. Now this may seem to be a rather obvious idea, but you would be surprised at how many people believe that new technologies are unmixed blessings. You need only think of the enthusiasm with which, with which most people approach their understanding of computers. Ask anyone who knows something about computers to talk about them, and you will find that they will unabashedly and relentlessly extol the wonders of computers. You will also find that in most cases they will completely neglect to mention any of the liabilities of computers. Now this is a dangerous imbalance since the greater the wonders of a technology, the greater will be some of its negative consequences. Think of the automobile which for all of its obvious advantages has poisoned our air, choked our cities, and degraded the beauty of our natural landscape. Or you might reflect on the paradox of medical technology, which brings wondrous cures, but is at the same time a demonstrable cause of certain diseases and disabilities, and has played a significant role in reducing the diagnostic skills of physicians. And it's also well to recall that for all of the intellectual and social benefits provided by the printing press, its costs were equally monumental. The printing press gave the Western world prose but it made poetry into an exotic and elitist form of communication. It gave us inductive science, but it reduced religious sensibility to a form of fanciful superstition. Printing gave us the modern conception of nationhood, but in so doing turned patriotism into a sordid, if not lethal, emotion. We might even say that the printing of the Bible in vernacular languages introduced the impression that God was an Englishman or a German or a Frenchman. That is to say, printing reduced God to the dimensions of a local potentate. Now, maybe the best way I can express this idea is to say that the question what will a new technology do is no more important than the question, what will a new technology undo? Indeed, the latter question is more important precisely because it's asked so infrequently. One might say then that a sophisticated perspective on technological change includes one's being skeptical of utopian and messianic visions drawn by those who have no sense of history or of the precarious balances on which culture depends. In fact, if it were up to me, I would forbid anyone from talking about the new information technologies unless the person can demonstrate that he or she knows something about the social and psychic effects of the alphabet, the mechanical clock, the printing press, and telegraphy. In other words, know something about the costs of great technologies. So idea number one is that culture always pays a price for technology. And that leads to the second idea which is that the advantages and disadvantages of new technologies are never distributed equally among the population. This means 
that every new technology benefits some and harms others. There are even some who are not affected at all. Consider again the case of the printing press in the 16th century, of which Martin Luther said it was God's highest and extremest act of grace whereby the business of the gospel is driven forward. By placing the word of God on every Christian's kitchen table, the mass-produced book undermined the authority of the church hierarchy and hastened the breakup of the Holy Roman See. The Protestants of that time cheered this development. The Catholics were enraged and distraught. Since I'm a Jew, had I lived at that time, I probably wouldn't have given a damn one way or the other. <clears throat> Since uh, it would make no difference whether a pogrom was inspired by Martin Luther or Pope Leo X. Some gain, some lose, a few remain as they were. Let's take another example, television. Although here I should add that in the case of television, there are very few indeed who are not affected in one way or another. In America, where television has taken hold more deeply than anywhere else, there are many people who find it a blessing, not least those who have achieved high-paying, gratifying careers in television as executives, technicians, directors, newscasters, and entertainers. On the other hand, and in the long run, television may bring an end to the careers of school teachers, since school was an invention of the printing press and must stand or fall on the issue of how much importance the printed word will have in the future. There is no chance, of course, that television will go away, but school teachers who are enthusiastic about its presence always call to my mind an image of some turn-of-the-century blacksmith who not only is singing the praises of the automobile, but who also believes that his business will be enhanced by it. Well, we know now that his business was not enhanced by it. It was rendered obsolete by it, as perhaps an intelligent blacksmith might have imagined. The questions, then, that are never far from the mind of a person who is knowledgeable about technological change are these. Who specifically benefits from the development of a new technology? Which groups, what type of person, what kind of industry will be favored? And of course, which groups of people will thereby be harmed? Now these questions should certainly be on our minds when we think about computer technology. There is no doubt that the computer has been and will continue to be advantageous to large-scale organizations like the military or airplane companies or banks or tax-collecting institutions. And it's equally clear that the computer is now indispensable to high-level researchers in physics and in biology, as we've just seen, and other natural sciences. But to what extent has computer technology been an advantage to the masses of people? To steel workers, vegetable store owners, automobile mechanics, m musicians, bricklayers, dentists, yes, theologians, and most of the rest into whose lives the computer now intrudes. These people have had their private matters made more accessible to powerful institutions. They are more easily tracked and controlled. They are subjected to more examinations and are increasingly mystified by the decisions made about them. They are more than ever reduced 
to mere numerical objects. They are being buried by junk mail, and they are easy targets for advertising agencies and political institutions. In a word, these people might be thought of as losers in the great computer revolution. Now, the winners, which include, among others, computer companies, multinational corporations, and the nation state, will, of course, encourage the losers to be enthusiastic about computer technology. That is the way of winners. And so in the beginning, they told the losers that with personal computers, the average person can balance a checkbook more neatly, keep better track of recipes, and make more logical shopping lists. Then they told them that computers will make it possible to vote at home, shop at home, get all the entertainment they wish at home, and thus, by the way, make community life unnecessary. And now, of course, the winners speak constantly of the age of information, always implying that the more information we have, the better we will be in solving significant social problems, not only personal ones, but large-scale social problems as well. Well, but how true is this? If there are children starving in the world, and there are, it is not because of insufficient information. We have known for a long time how to produce enough food to feed every child on the planet. How is it that we have left so many of them to starve? If there is violence on our streets, it is not because we have insufficient information. If women are abused, if divorce and pornography and mental illness are increasing, none of it has anything to do with insufficient information. None of it. I dare say it is because something else is missing. And I don't think I have to tell this audience what it is. Who knows? This age of information may turn out to be a curse if we are so blinded by it that we cannot see truly where our problems lie. And that's why it's always necessary for us to ask of those who speak enthusiastically about the information age and computers. Why do you do this? What interests do you represent? To whom are you hoping to give power? And from whom will you be withholding power? Now, I don't mean to attribute unsavory, let alone sinister motives, to anyone. I say only that since technology favors some people and harms others, these are questions that must always be asked. And so, that there are always winners and losers in technological change is the second idea. Here's the third. Embedded in every technology, there is a powerful idea, sometimes two or three powerful ideas. Mr. Bailey was talking about some of them before. Now, these ideas are often hidden from our view because they are of a somewhat abstract nature. But this should not be taken to mean that they do not have practical consequences. Perhaps you are familiar with the old adage that says, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, we can extend that truism. To a person with a pencil, everything looks like a sentence. To a person with a TV camera, everything looks like an image. To a person with a computer, perhaps everything looks like data. Now, I don't think we need to take these aphorisms literally. 
But what they call to our attention is that every technology has a prejudice. It is not neutral. Like language itself, it predisposes us to favor and value certain perspectives and accomplishments. In a culture without writing, human memory is of the greatest importance, as are the proverbs, sayings, and songs which contain the accumulated oral wisdom of centuries. That's why Solomon was thought to be the wisest of men. In Kings 1, we are told he knew 3,000 proverbs. But in a culture with writing, such feats of memory are considered a waste of time, and proverbs are merely irrelevant fancies. The writing person favors logical organization and systematic analysis, not proverbs. The telegraphic person values speed, not introspection. The television person values immediacy, not history. And computer people. Well, what shall we say of them? Perhaps we can say that the computer person values information, not knowledge, and certainly not wisdom. Indeed, in the computer age, the concept of wisdom may vanish altogether. So the third idea is that every technology has a philosophy which is given expression in how the technology makes people use their minds, in what it makes us do with our bodies, in how it codifies the world, in which of our senses it amplifies, in which of our emotional and intellectual tendencies it disregards. This idea, by the way, is the sum and substance of what the great Catholic prophet, Marshall McLuhan, meant when he coined the famous sentence, the medium is the message. Here's the fourth idea. Technological change is not additive, it is ecological. And I can explain this best by an analogy. What happens if we place a drop of red dye into a beaker of clear water? After a minute or so, what do we have? Do we now have clear water plus a spot of red dye? Obviously not. We have a new coloration to every molecule of the water. Now that's what I mean by ecological change. A new medium does not add something. It changes everything. In the year 1500, after the printing press with movable type was invented, we did not have old Europe plus the printing press. We had a different Europe. After television, America was not America plus television. Television gave a new coloration to every political campaign, to every home, every school, every church, every industry, and so on. Now this is why we must be cautious about technological innovation. The consequences of technological change are always vast, often unpredictable, and largely irreversible. And that is also why we must be suspicious of capitalists. Now, capitalists are by definition not only personal risk takers, but more to the point, cultural risk takers. The most creative and daring of them hope to exploit new technologies to the fullest and do not much care what traditions are overthrown in the process or whether or not a culture is prepared to function 
without such traditions. Capitalists are, in a word, radicals. In America, our most significant radicals have always been our capitalists. Men like Bell, Edison, Ford, Kirk Carnegie, Sarnoff, Goldwyn, Disney, these men obliterated the 19th century and created the 20th. Which is why it is an absolute mystery to me that capitalists are thought to be conservative. Perhaps it's because they're inclined to wear dark suits and gray ties. <clears throat> now, I trust you understand that in saying this, I am making no argument for socialism. I say only that capital capitalists need to be carefully watched and disciplined to be sure they talk of family, marriage, piety, and honor. But if allowed to exploit new technology to its fullest economic potential, <clears throat> they may undo the institutions that make such ideas possible. And here I might just give two examples at this point taken from the American encounter with technology. The first concerns education. Who, we may ask, has had the greatest impact on American education in this century? Well, if you are thinking of John Dewey or any other uh, uh, education philosopher, I must say uh, you're quite wrong. The greatest impact has been made by quiet men in gray suits living in a suburb of New York City called Princeton, New Jersey. There, they developed and promoted the technology known as the standardized test, such as IQ tests, the SATs, and the GREs. Their tests redefined what we mean by learning and have resulted in our reorganizing the curriculum throughout America to accommodate their tests. Here's a second example. This one concerns our politics. It's pretty clear by now that the people who have had the most radical effect on American politics in our time are not political ideologues or student protesters with long hair and copies of Karl Marx under their arms. The radicals who have changed the nature of politics in America are entrepreneurs in dark suits and gray ties who manage the large television industry in America. They did not mean to turn political discourse into a form of entertainment. They did not mean to make it impossible for an overweight person to run for high political office. They did not mean to reduce political campaigning to a 30-second TV commercial. All they were trying to do is to make television into a vast and unsleeping money machine that they destroyed substantive political discourse in the process does not concern them. I come now to the fifth and final idea, which is that media tend to become mythic. Now, I use this word mythic in the sense in which it was used by the French literary critic Roland Barthes. He used the word myth to refer to a common tendency to think of our technological creations as if they were God-given, as if they were part of the natural order of things. I have on occasion asked my own students if they know when the, the alphabet was invented. The question startles them. It, it is as if I ask them when clouds and trees were invented. The alphabet, they think, was not something that was invented. 
It just is. Well, it's this way with many products of human culture, but with none more consistently than technology. Cars, planes, TV, movies, newspapers, they have achieved mythic status because they are perceived as gifts of nature, not as artifacts produced in a specific political and historical context. When a technology becomes mythic, it's always dangerous because it's then accepted as it is and is therefore not easily susceptible to modification or control. If you should propose to the average American that television broadcasting should not begin until 5 p.m. and should cease at 11 p.m., or propose that there should be no television commercials, he will think the idea ridiculous, but not because he necessarily disagrees with your cultural agenda. He will think it ridiculous because he assumes you are proposing that something in nature be changed, as if you are suggesting that the sun should rise at 10 a.m. instead of at 6. Whenever I think about the capacity of technology to become mythic, I call to mind the remark made by Pope uh, John Paul II. He said, science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Now what I'm saying is that our enthusiasm for technology can turn into a form of idolatry and our belief in its beneficence can be a false absolute. The best way, I think, to view technology is as a strange intruder. To remember that technology is not part of God's plan but a product of human creativity and hubris, and that its capacity for good or evil rests entirely on human awareness of what it does for us and to us. And so, these are my five ideas about technological change. First, that we always pay a price for technology. The greater the technology, the greater the price. Second, that there are always winners and losers, and that the winners always try to persuade the losers that they are really winners. Third, that there is embedded in every great technology an epistemological, a spiritual, a political, or social prejudice. Sometimes that prejudice is greatly to our advantage. Sometimes it is not. The printing press annihilated the oral tradition. Telegraphy annihilated space. Television has humiliated the word. The computer perhaps will degrade the idea of community life, and so on. Fourth, technological change is not additive, it is ecological, which means it changes everything and is therefore too important to be left entirely in the hands of Bill Gates. And fifth, technology tends to become mythic. That is perceived as part of the natural order of things, and therefore tends to control more of our lives than could possibly be good for us. If we had more time, I, I could supply some additional important things about technological change, but, uh, but I'll stand by these for the moment and we'll close with this thought. In the past, we experienced technological change in the manner of sleepwalkers. Our unspoken slogan has been, technology uba alles. And we have been willing to shape our lives to fit the requirements of technology, not the requirements of culture. 
This is a form of stupidity, especially in an age of vast technological change. I think you must agree that we need to proceed here with our eyes wide open so that we may use technology rather than be used by it. Thank you.